chapter seven of early days of old oregon by catherine barry judson this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter seven how they built astoria outside the terrible bar of the columbia tossed a little sailing ship one gray march day in eighteen eleven this was just five years after lewis and clark had left the mouth of the columbia and had gone back across the plains and the mountains to st louis this ship was the tonquin on board were the partners and clerks of the fur company she was waiting for a fair wind to carry her through the channel amidst the breakers on the bar the men on that ship looked in dismay at the scene around them directly in front of them for miles dashed and thundered and pounded the white waves on the bar because the wind was strong once in among those breakers the little sailing vessel would be carried this way and that perhaps pounding upon a bar with great white cumbers crashing over her and go down as many a ship has done since and this was the very place of course where captain robert gray nearly twenty years before had sailed over that famous bar beyond the bar was a great open bay where the water was less rough at last the ship lowered a small boat with four men in it and sent it in to find the channel both crew and passengers on the tonquin watched it anxiously the small boat went in toward the channel was caught in the waves struggled a while and then went down no one ever again saw that boat or any man that was in it the next day another boat was lowered with four men because that channel had to be found that too was caught by the breakers and went down only one of the men was saved he was washed ashore and found later nearly dead what were they to do the passengers on the tonquin were fur traders and they had come to build a fur trading post at the mouth of the columbia they had to get into that river at last at a favourable turn of the tide when the wind had died down a little and the breeze came from the right direction captain jonathan thorne tried to sail in through what seemed to be the channel and though it was night yet somehow they never knew just how the ship slipped through that narrow winding channel among the sandbars and drifted into baker's bay the next morning the very first thing they did was to go ashore and build a pig pen the tonquin was crowded not only with people including kanakas whom they had engaged at the sandwich islands but also with pigs and cows which they had bought there there was little room for anybody the animals had to be landed and they were in a very short time so that the crowded ship was more comfortable the next step was to find a site for the fort all about them on both sides of the river the dense black forests came down to the water's edge the banks of the river were quite steep for a fort they needed to have close at hand logs of the right size for cabins they needed the river for their ships spring water or else river water nearby for drinking as well as for washing and cooking they needed space for a garden and for their livestock and they needed also a fairly level space on which to erect their cabins which they would have to fence in none of the places near the ship seemed to be suitable the partners went up the river and down and over to the south side while captain thorne scolded about smoking and picnic parties the stern captain insisted they must find a place quickly or else he would land the trading goods and everything else and sail away to trade for furs along the coast north of them so they hurried to find a good spot nearby two of the partners went up the river from baker's bay where the ship was anchored promising to be back on a certain day they met an old one-eyed chief named comcomly a funny old fellow who was very friendly to them after talking to him by signs and spending several days searching along the shore for a good sight they started back to the ship the wind had risen and the water was rough comcomly warned them not to go but the partners had promised and they were rather afraid of captain thorne so back they started the waves were high the river was covered with whitecaps they had gone only a mile when up dashed a big wave and down went the boat 
but Comcomly's indian tribesmen had been trailing them down the river and were not far away outstretched the long red arms of the chinooks in spite of the tossing high waves and caught the white men struggling in the water then they pulled them into their canoe the indians of the columbia were expert oarsmen but the partners had to go back to the old chief's camp and stay there until the storm was over and that was two or three days shortly after their return to the ship it was decided to build their little fort on the south side of the river upon a point they named point george just where the city of astoria is to-day the new post itself however they called fort astoria mr john jacob astor of new york city was the head of the fur company which was called the pacific fur company but usually his men were called astorians but the point selected was not a particularly good one after all their trouble the building of the fort was hard and dangerous work point george was on a steep hillside covered with enormous trees many were two hundred feet high and more some were six and eight feet in diameter every man had to begin tree chopping whether he knew anything about it or not and few did know how the traders the clerks the canoemen the kanakas from the sandwich island all went to work to clear the spot of these tremendous trees alexander ross and you will find him in other chapters of this book tells the story of the building of fort astoria first they picked out a tree they could get at for the trees were all close together and the underbrush was high then they built a scaffold around it so that they could stand above the rocks among the roots four men would begin to chop such a tree none knowing how some had short-handled axes and others long-handled ones this made the chopping harder their guns they rested against a nearby tree while they chopped but the woods around them were full of indians and every time they heard a rustling in the jungle of underbrush they dropped their axes and picked up their guns that made slow work at last after much toil when the big tree was cut through so that it should fall it would begin to topple over but behold it would catch at the top of another immense tree and hang there a danger to every one there was not room enough for it to fall another would be cut and begin to fall in just the same way catching in another tree and so three or four of these great giant trees would hang together in most dangerous fashion at last they would cut another and then at last when their weight carried them down two or three or four trees would fall all together with a crash which echoed across the river and back again and through the dense forests around them even then the logs were so big nothing could be done with them they had to be blown to pieces with gunpowder and the chunks rolled into the river several men were hurt by gunpowder accidents yet all this time these men in turn had to stand guard at night for fear of indians with all their toil and work and sleeplessness in the wet weather they had no tents in which to sleep and very poor food they had only boiled fish and the roots which the indians brought to sell to them worse than all it was early in the spring and the weather was wet and cold every other day was a day of rain ross said even when it did not rain the lowering gray skies the dreariness made the men unhappy and the damp fogs chilled them through it was indeed a lonely spot with the wide river in front bordered on both sides with dark forests full of indians to the westward lay that terrible bar and day and night they heard the fearful crashing of the breakers to the eastward somewhere even though two thousand miles away across mountains and deserts lay the united states so some of the men deserted trying to get home overland but the indians farther up the river captured them as they trudged toward the cascades and made them slaves then the officer in charge mr duncan mcdougall had to buy them back with many gifts to the indians at last with all their work with the lack of sleep and of good food in spite of the sullenness of mcdougall and the scoldings of captain thorn who lived on his ship and traded with the indians at last enough ground was cleared for their fort 
a building was put up for a trading shop and as a warehouse for the supplies of all kinds then on june one captain thorne cleared his decks and made ready for sailing on that coasting voyage for which he was so eager and from which he never came back the indians attacked the ship at cleoquot harbor and massacred the crew and the captain as well on june five the traders at fort astoria watched the tonquin as she passed over the bar all sails swelling majestic and beautiful but with her went their last chance of reaching the world outside but there was no time to be lonely there was not a stockade yet that is a high spiked fence of logs this was put all around the buildings and a small bit of ground to protect them from indian attack this stockade was about fifteen feet high it was made so high and spiked so that indians could not climb over it at diagonal corners were two blockhouses of good-sized logs which were two stories high these blockhouses were built into the corners of the stockade so that they looked into the fort and from them could be seen both sides of the stockade nearby men looking out from loopholes in the blockhouses could see and shoot at any indian on either of the sides guarded by them who might be trying to climb in the fort or set fire to it or break through it the logs which formed the picket fence as one writer called it were also the back logs of some of the cabins which were erected inside the fort yard these smaller houses were dwelling houses for the men and partners and blacksmith shop and later on a hospital was built for the inner walls of these buildings they needed smaller logs than the trunks of the great trees about the fort so the men had to go back into the forest for these smaller trees but there were no horses or mules or oxen so the workmen had to harness themselves as animals and six or eight of them pulling together would drag a log out of the forest into the stockade it was exceedingly hard work indeed they worked so hard and so carefully that the next year when the second ship the beaver came in with more supplies and more men they had a fairly good fort inside the stockade when the beaver arrived there were more dwellings for the men and a carpenter's shop besides other storehouses by this time the stockade was well guarded as cannon had been put into the blockhouses and muskets were kept in the second story to be used if necessary through the loopholes outside the stockade was a little garden though it did not succeed well potatoes flourished and a few turnips but the mice ate all the radishes and the turnips went to seed too quickly the soil was too cold and the weather too chilly for gardening at that point but long before the beaver came in in that second year the traders began to be worried because the tonquin did not return late in the summer of eighteen eleven rumors floated about among the indians that she had been destroyed later mcdougall and other traders began to hear this things began to look serious behind these few cabins in this stockade rose a towering forest of spruce firs hemlock and pine the underbrush was so thick and dense that one could pass through it only on the indian trails and this forest as well as the dense black woods all along the river on both sides all about them everywhere swarmed with indians they would be only too glad to kill the white men and capture the fort for the sake of the guns and bullets and powder for the blankets and paint and copper kettles that were in it at this time the friendly indians began to be shy which was a bad sign then great numbers of strange indians came into baker's bay from the north they were the sullen savage grim-looking indians whom captain Meares had seen around tatouche island and the straits of san juan de fuca these indians pretended they came for the sturgeon fishing but they held long councils things looked serious indeed duncan mcdougall saw the danger and he was an old indian trader he at once called a council of all the chiefs of the nearby tribes when they were all squatting on their heels in a semicircle in indian fashion and had smoked their council pipe he pulled a small bottle out of his pocket mcdougall handled the bottle with great care and the indians watched him keenly in this bottle said trader mcdougall i hold a great sickness 
if i draw the cork all of you will have it but if you will be friends to the white men i will let no harm come among you the indians quickly promised to be friendly perhaps the white traders saved themselves in this way we do not know exactly but this ruse was not nearly so pleasant or so funny as the one which dr john mclaughlin used at fort vancouver fifteen years later later on the traders knew the whole truth how captain thorn was so rough with the indians that he had angered them and they had come on deck one day pretending to sell furs and when many were on shipboard they had killed the crew and the traders not a man remained to tell the story the indian interpreter who had gone with them told it later on to the indians near fort astoria after the beaver came it seemed as though all would go well fort okanagan was built that first summer eighteen eleven and now after the beaver came in fort spokane was built eighteen twelve and both these forts in the upper country were successful in trading you will read about adventures there in later chapters but the very year after that eighteen thirteen because war had been declared between great britain and the united states the astorians were forced to sell their three forts to the canadian fur traders the northwest company of montreal they were shut off from all the world since they had no ship and could not go home overland the indians were threatening again their trading goods were running low and they could hardly buy food and did not dare to use the goods in trading for furs the sale of the fort has been called treachery but it was not if you visit astoria today in the park on the hilltop you will find a fort built there with a stockade of spiked logs around it it is thought to be a close copy of that tiny fort built at astoria a hundred years ago the first one however was built at the water's edge with dense forests all around it it looked out over the broad columbia and the foaming breakers of the bar if you look at it carefully you will see what a very small fort it was to stand all alone in the indian territory on a wild lonely coast End of chapter seven